Tuberculosis, or TB, is one of the most common infectious diseases in the world. Each year, almost a million and a half people die from TB disease, and TB remains the leading cause of death among people living with HIV. The good news is that TB is preventable, can be treated, and can usually be cured. TB can be transmitted in healthcare settings when patients and healthcare workers come into contact with persons who have undiagnosed or untreated pulmonary TB disease. In fact, healthcare workers are one to 14 times more likely to be infected with TB than the general population. As a healthcare worker, you can take simple steps to prevent the transmission of TB in your hospital and thus play a vital role in improving TB infection control in your hospital. In this video, you will learn how TB is spread, who is at high risk of developing TB, what are the types of TB, why TB infection control is important, and how you can reduce TB transmission in your hospital. The procedures shown in this video are based on the 2009 World Health Organization's policy on TB infection control in healthcare facilities, congregate settings, and households. TB is usually spread when a person with pulmonary TB disease coughs, sneezes, sings, or even talks loudly. Tiny particles invisible to the naked eye, called droplet nuclei, pass through the air containing the TB bacteria. These droplet nuclei can't be seen, but they remain in the air for many hours. When someone breathes in the bacteria, he or she can become infected with TB. Many people infected with the TB bacteria never get sick. The infection remains inactive or latent. As a result, two TB-related conditions exist, latent TB infection and TB disease. When TB bacteria live in the body without making you sick, it is called latent TB infection. Some people can have latent TB infection for years and not get sick. However, in other people, TB bacteria overcome the defenses of the immune system and begin to multiply, resulting in the progression from latent TB infection to TB disease. People with pulmonary TB disease are considered infectious and may spread TB bacteria to others. It is more likely that TB will be transmitted when a person with TB disease coughs, passes a lot of bacteria into the air, and spends a lot of time with others, especially in small enclosed spaces that have limited air movement. We need to think about which people are most likely to become infected with the TB bacteria and which people are most likely to get sick. People in close contact with others with TB disease are the most likely to become infected. Because of your job, you are very likely to come in contact with people with TB disease, and that puts you at high risk of getting infected with TB as well. Other patients and visitors may come into contact with patients who have TB disease and may also be at risk for infection. Again, many people who are infected with the TB bacteria never get sick, but some people are at higher risk these include people living with HIV because they are very susceptible to infections because they have a weakened immune system. Other people who are susceptible to TB disease include children, people who have diabetes, cancer, or kidney failure, and those taking immunosuppressive medications like steroids or chemotherapy. There are several types of TB disease. Most cases of TB are caused by bacteria that can be treated with the standard TB drugs. This type of TB is referred to as drug-sensitive TB. But other types of TB all of the time, including at night and during the winter. If mosquitoes are a problem, use bed nets for all patients who sleep in the unit. Examination and consulting rooms in the hospital should be arranged so airflow moves away from the clinician
toward the patient and to the outside or in between the patient and provider. This also applies to other high-risk areas such as radiology and the autopsy room. If you work in a TB ward, the door to the unit should remain closed whenever possible to avoid spreading infection to others outside of the unit. Mechanical ventilation is another type of environmental control. It includes use of mechanical airflow systems designed to supply and exhaust air to maintain comfort. Because of their complexity, mechanical ventilation systems should be planned for, installed and maintained by qualified engineers. Regular maintenance and budgetary provision are needed to ensure that you can rely on these devices to create the required airflow. Ordinary air conditioning units do not reduce the risk of TB transmission, nor do they filter the bacteria out of the air. Their function is to condition the air to be either colder or warmer. Placing a presumed or known pulmonary TB patient in an air conditioned room with others actually increases everyone's risk of exposure. Where the budget permits, ultraviolet germicidal irradiation, also known as UVGI fixtures, may be placed in the upper part of a room to help clear the air of infectious bacteria. UVGI fixtures should be installed to ensure uniformly high levels of UVGI in the upper room and low or safe levels of UVGI in the occupied portion of the room. Well-designed UVGI fixtures must be properly installed by experienced professionals. If they are not placed high enough in the room or are of poor design, they can cause eye irritation to patients, visitors, and healthcare workers. For UVGI fixtures to work effectively and kill the TB bacteria, they must be regularly cleaned and maintained. They also require continuous air movement from a ceiling fan or other device so that the TB bacteria can be exposed to the UVGI beam. Details on UVGI are discussed in a separate video. Now we'll cover some environmental control measures you can use to make sputum collection a safer procedure. When a patient coughs to produce a sputum sample, thousands of bacteria can escape into the surrounding air. To prevent others from being exposed to TB, sputum collection should be done outside in a designated location away from others. If sputum collection must be done indoors, it should be done in a well-ventilated room that does not have other patients, or in a sputum collection booth specifically designed to extract air to the outside. Sputum collection should not be done at the bedside or in small poorly ventilated bathrooms, stairwells, or other poorly ventilated areas because this does not provide adequate safety to other patients or staff members. Hospital staff should ensure that space is used as effectively as possible. TB rooms or wards should be located away from patients who are at high risk of developing TB. TB patients and persons presumed to have TB should not be housed in a general medical ward. In addition, the TB unit and units with patients with presumed TB should house as few patients as possible per room to minimize the risks of spreading bacteria between patients. As a general droplet transmission precaution, more space between beds may slightly reduce the risk of TB transmission. As discussed earlier, wards should have good cross ventilation to move cleaner cool air into the room at one side and push warmer air up and across to the outside. When hospitals are planning a renovation or new construction, it's important to consult with infection control experts who can ensure that environmental control measures are included to the bridge of your nose to match the contours of your nose and face. The placement check, sometimes called a seal check, verifies proper placement of the respirator. 
you should do a placement check each time you wear the respirator. If you are having trouble getting a successful placement, ask a coworker to examine your strap placement and the facial seams of the respirator. Hair or earrings might be in the way, or the respirator may be too large or too small to get a perfect fit. If available, do qualitative fit testing the first time you use your respirator and annually thereafter to determine which type and size of respirator you need. The procedure is conducted by someone who has been trained to conduct fit testing. Step one is to do a sensitivity test. This procedure relies on the healthcare worker's response to a harmless, sweet, or bitter testing solution while under a fit testing hood without a respirator and breathing through their mouth. A hood is placed over your head without the respirator. You will be asked to open your mouth and breathe normally. One to 10 squeezes of a testing solution will be sprayed into the hood. If you do not taste the fit test solution in 10 squeezes, another one to 10 squeezes will be applied. If not tasted, another one to 10 squeezes are applied. Usually, people taste or sense the solution within the first 10 squeezes. If you cannot sense the solution after 30 squeezes, the test will be stopped. The testing staff will then record the number of squeezes delivered at the time you first sensed the solution. Once you have sensed the test solution, you will be asked to move away from the testing area and return in 10 to 15 minutes to allow you to clear the solution from your nose and mouth. At this point, you will be asked to drink sips of water and wash your face to remove any trace amounts of solution. Step two is to test the fit of the respirator. Put on the N95 or FFP2 respirator. Do a placement check. The hood will now be placed over your head and you will be told to alert the testing staff if you taste the solution with the respirator in place. You will be asked to do various movements for 60 seconds, such as breathing normally for 60 seconds, then breathe deeply, move your head from side to side, moving your head up and down, bending over, talking, and again, breathing normally. Throughout the test, a staff member will spray the solution inside the hood in increments of one to 10 squeezes as before. If you taste or sense the solution afterward, the test will be stopped, as the respirator does not have a user good seal and should be adjusted. You can then be retested 15 minutes later. You will be asked to drink some water and clean your face again. If you do not sense the solution while wearing the respirator, after 30 total squeezes are completed, you will be asked to break the face seal with your finger and breathe through your mouth. If you can sense the solution after the face seal is broken, you will be told that you have passed the fit test and the results will be recorded as per your facility policy. To remove your respirator, simply remove the lower strap first then the upper strap with your hands, being careful to handle only the straps. As with all personal protective equipment, always clean your hands afterwards. The reuse of your N95 or FFP2 respirator is limited by hygiene and damage. Follow your facility infection control policy on reusing respirators. Respirators can be reused when their primary purpose had been healthcare worker protection in close contact with persons with TB or presumed TB. Discard N95 or FFP2 respirators following use during aerosol generating procedures or if it is soiled, wet, or damaged. If planning to reuse a respirator, label your respirator with your name and store it in a well-ventilated